good afternoon uh, today's uh, lecture we are going to devote on a theme that is constitutionalism uh, and democracy and uh, this is something which is very important from the point of view of understanding democracy in today's world uh, in fact uh, before i move further i would like to uh, mention here at the very outset that from the very beginning about democracy there has been a perception that it is difficult to uh, build the foundation of democracy in a plural and segmented society and therefore it was from the very beginning it was you know assumed uh, that you know social homogeneity and political consensus are the basis of stability in democracy and this is something a very old premise so far as the theory of democracy is concerned uh, in fact uh, people you know scholars have gone to the extent saying that you know the establishment of democracy in a segmented and plural society is always a herculean task and in fact uh, you know this is along with this there has also been a parallel argument that sharp social divisions and wide uh, you know political disagreements in plural society at times result into instability and therefore in fact uh, it is very difficult for democracy to function in such context in fact in recent years uh you know in political theory in comparative politics we have seen the rise of a new uh you know discourse so far as democracy is concerned and it is associated with you know a, a scholar a thinker aaron lefort and uh, he is considered as a theorist of constitutionalism and through his writings he has tried to show uh, that it may be difficult to set up a stable democracy in societies with wide cleavages but it is not impossible to achieve through proper elite accommodation and power sharing mechanism and therefore he basically uh, puts forth an argument which tries to plug you know a major hole in this entire uh, democratic theory which has existed since you know time immemorial particularly in modern times uh, where it has been assumed that only in homogeneous society with certain you know requirements requirements like economic development high rate of literacy social homogeneity uh, one can think of democracy and uh, these factors have been cited from time to time uh, by all political thinkers who have basically engaged with this question of democracy and democracy uh, you know the functioning of democracy in uh, you know complex and plural society uh, so much so that john stuart mill one of uh, you know the great champion of liberty and representative government in fact he is a uh, think uh, who you know who authored two you know classic work on these two themes uh, on uh, representative government uh, and uh, on uh, you know on liberty uh, in fact john stuart mill uh, when it came to the question of uh, you know of granting democratic rights and democracy in british colonies like india in fact he developed a cold feet and uh, he is argued uh that you know democracy was not you know appropriate or was not uh, you know the right form of uh, you know of system or government for these colonies because they were still in waiting room uh, of history they had not matured culturally civilizationally and therefore they had to wait and he only argued for granting of these rights to white colonies like australia new zealand and so on and so forth so therefore uh in fact this has been a major you know puzzle uh, so far as democracy is concerned from the very beginning uh that in what context what are the material conditions required for you know the flowering of democratic institutions and democratic uh process uh in fact uh, there is a great amount of debate uh, on you know sequentializing uh you know democracy uh that how you know from time to time with the historical developments democracy can get firm roots uh, in fact the debate on democracy and development uh, has also been there and this has been hotly debated uh, you know by the scholars and uh, one can say that you know the, when this debate happens among scholars uh, the reference point invariably becomes the western democracy particularly its experience is pitted against uh, you know the other experiences mostly from uh, you know the third world countries asia africa and latin america uh where basically you know democracy preceded development and because we if we do a comparison between the two then we find 
that in Western democracy, particularly in Europe, North America, uh, you know, we find uh, that development came first and began gradually in installments. Uh, you know, democratic rights were granted to the people. So much so that in 20th century, women suffrage uh, became a reality, particularly after, you know, the suffrage movement and uh, other things happened. So therefore, what we find uh, that this democracy development debate is an old issue. Uh, in, uh, in fact, uh, in, in political science, comparative politics, even in political economy. And uh, in, in this debate, whenever we look at this debate, we find that development is basically prioritized over democracy. Uh, and it is argued that only if, in a, you know, if there is a proper development, economic, social development, then only democratic institutions can uh, you know, flourish. Only then democratic institutions can uh, function. So therefore, what has happened that in light of such premises, uh, which are considered foundational for democratic theory, uh, in fact, uh, this entire intervention in name of this constitutional theory uh, has become a very important reference point uh, in recent years, particularly, you know, uh, among scholars debating this question that is, uh, can democracy flourish in a situation of diversity? Or uh, a question is often raised whether diversity is a hurdle or a strength so far as democracy and demo is building democratic institutions and practicing democratic values is concerned. Now, of course, uh, you know, here, in fact, it will not be inapt to refer to the two important you know, uh, discussions or one can say debates which happened in 20th century, particularly in 50s and 60s, uh, particularly after this behavioral revolution and a structural functionalism uh, as an offshoot of that intellectual uh, climate, uh, in fact, gripped the minds of political scientists all over the world. And structural functionalists like Almond, uh, Bharwa and others who initiated a new debate on political culture and make distinction between different types of political culture, uh, you know, from uh, participant and, uh, you know, subject and so on and so forth. And when they talked of civic culture, uh, in fact, Bharva, uh, Bharva's argument was very simple, that for democracy, you need a particular type of political culture. And only when you have a, that political culture, that one can think of democratic uh, institutions to be uh, functioning in a proper form. Otherwise, there will be many uh, digressions, there will be many distortions and deformities which will creep in. Now, let, you know, later, uh, in fact, another important debate was initiated by Italian, uh, you know, comparativist and, you know, scholar Putnam, particularly through his argument about social capital, uh, when he talked of, uh, you know, a particular situation in society, in civil society, where, uh, you know, social capital is created and that becomes the glue uh, for number of, uh, you know, social actions and democracy also becomes, you know, the beneficiary of social capital if there is a proper, uh, you know, repository of social capital in society. So, therefore, in fact, these recent interventions, uh, you know, in particular in 20th century, uh, be it, you know, the political culture uh, argument or the social capital, all of them have been basically built, uh, you know, with this purpose uh, to theorize about democracy in a situation, uh, particularly the non-Western situation, in non-Western world, where it was considered to be, uh, you know, characterized by, you know, multi, um, multiple identities, pluralism, uh, heterogeneity, uh, segmented, you know, society and so on and so forth. And therefore, uh, in fact, this entire, uh, you know, attempt was to uh, look at this issue that how in non-Western situation, non-Western societies, uh, you know, liberal democratic, uh, you know, values and institutions can find roots. So therefore, these two, you know, approaches came in that context. In recent years, uh, you know, with the advent of this consociational theory, uh, we find that altogether a new and very refreshing set of arguments have been offered and uh, that becomes uh, very important for us uh, to see uh, that, you know, what is the argument of constitutional theory, uh, what are its contributions, uh, what is its, you know, main premise uh, 
and how it tries to argue that you know democracy can function in a segmented society of course uh, you know it's high priest as i mentioned leopard uh, you know he men he argues that it is difficult but not impossible to build democracy uh, in a segmented society so therefore uh, in fact this is something very important but before i move further uh, you know one thing is important to remember uh, that at times when we deal with this constitutional theory of democracy uh, you know an attempt is made uh, to uh, you know make comparison between constitutionalism and classical pluralist theory of democracy uh, or classical pluralist theory now what are the points of comparison and what are the points of uh, deviations uh, that is also important now constitutional theory uh, to some extent uh, you know like classical pluralist uh, consider societal plurality appropriate for peace and stability and therefore uh, this is a very important uh, point of comparison between the two now the way one of the leading theorists of uh, classical pluralism truman talked about multiple group membership we find that you know leford talks about cross cutting cleavage so therefore in fact the arguments have a lot of resemblance now many scholars believe that constitutional theory is offshoot of classical pluralism uh in fact uh you know only difference is that constitutionalism deals with different situation and multiple cleavages whereas you know classical pluralism uh dealt with only a particular type of cleavage that is basically a uh, western uh, liberal democratic society particularly united states of america where it had uh, many uh, you know uh, you know many takers and many theorists basically talked about it be dal or anyone else particularly the way dal talked about his uh, theory of polyarchy now so therefore this is a comparison but one thing is also to be remember that where constitutional theory and its theorists like leford uh, he basically uh, you know uh, gives primacy to parliamentary system so far as this uh, you know constitutional democracy is concerned because some of the four important uh, features of constitutional democracy which leford lays down uh, in fact uh, like grand theory a uh, grand coalition uh, minority veto uh, you know then autonomy uh, you know cultural autonomy and other things uh, he feels that perhaps they are best uh, workable within a context of parliamentary democracy now on the other hand we find that the classical pluralist uh, like dal and others they always assume that they were uh, more you know appropriate within presidential and the federal system as they exist in united states of america so that is perhaps a kind of you know point of difference one can notice between classical pluralism and constitutional uh, you know theory but still we find there are points of uh, similarities also there now after having uh, looked at this uh, you know comparison which is often made between constitutional theory and uh, you know classical pluralism uh, let's uh, move to another important issue that what is this constitutional theory what is this all about uh, what is its major uh, premises and how it tries to basically uh, fill the gap which exists on this uh, question of demo building democracy in complex plural and segmented society in fact uh, this constitution in constitutional democracy uh, you know it is argued that the centrifugal uh you know centrifugal tendencies which are inherent in plural societies uh you know are countered by cooperative behavior of leaders of different groups and segments of population and therefore uh in fact in 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 other words one can say that the constitutional democracy is essentially an argument for power sharing power sharing by accommodating various group interests particularly through elites accommodation so therefore this is how it tries to counter the centrifugal tendencies which are inherent in plural society in fact leford talks about four features of constitutional system and these four features are basically the you know uh, essential premise of this entire theory so far as building democracy in complex and segmented society is concerned the first premise is the premise of grand coalition uh, because you know the theory argues that the government Uh, has to function through power sharing the elites from the different uh, 
segments of society are to be inducted in government and thereby uh, you know the chances of uh, you know alienation of any group uh, from the political process can be taken care of so therefore this is a basically a very important premise that is how coalition can be built and uh, you know this coalition can accommodate multiple interests and can also assuage uh, the feelings of various groups including minorities uh, basically uh, one of the reason uh, that you know such theories are required so far democracy is concerned is largely on account of this problem of minorities in society uh, in fact uh, you know the earlier the pluralist theory the classical pluralist theory about which we were talking earlier in fact was essentially concerned with the tyranny of the majority uh, particularly uh, the way the classical you know theory of democracy also talked about beat mill or uh, you know the other thinkers but you know this uh, constitutional theory uh, instead of uh, getting concerned with the question of tyranny of majority is mainly concerned about the you know the future of minorities uh, within democracy of course mill also talked of minority but a different type of minority basically when he was talking of minorities in parliament he was or you know in democracy he was essentially talking about the wealthy people and the literate people the educated people as a minority particularly in terms of uh, universal franchise and expansion of uh, rights but you know this entire question of minority uh, is a very important issue and therefore you know in recent years the kind of interest which people have scholars have shown or this discipline is basically showing on this question is largely on account of this question of a minority problem and minority problem is not confined to one society but is spreading all over the world particularly in era of globalization with the problem of immigration uh, with new challenges which are emerging now this minority problem uh, is basically a problem which every society from europe to asia to africa to latin america one can talk of any you know society any continent is beset with so therefore this minority issue is a very important issue for democracy and particularly from the point of view of stable democracy and a more effective uh, as a effective mode of uh, government now minority can uh, you know the minority identity can come from number of sources it can come from language it can come from race it can come from ethnicity it can come from religion uh, in fact uh, china for example has one particular ethnic group han which is 92% so therefore you know the other ethnic groups can be considered minority india and indonesia and two other asian countries have many ethnic groups and many of them are in minority in fact entire europe today is basically facing this problem of minority particularly in light of this new wave of immigration in last 3 4 decades so therefore this minority issue of course has been there uh, since first world war in fact one should remember wilson's 14 points the way the right to self determination uh, and other issues were basically at that time talked about particularly in context of the european uh, situation uh, the way you know the boundaries were redrawn but at that time as we know that number of strategies were adopted to deal with this minority question of course uh, from the ideological point of view one can say that there were two dominant modes of dealing with this minority and minority rights one was the liberal mode particularly the federal theory was a major invention uh, in this sense because federalism as it emerged in united states of america with you know the great minds like madison jefferson and others in fact federalism at that time tried to deal with this question particularly uh, you know from the point of view of territorial identities of groups and therefore it was a major contribution it was a major uh, you know attempt to deal with this question of minority the another important uh, you know mechanism which was thought of uh, at that time was the you know the socialist or the communist uh, mode that was basically the soviet union the way it tried to deal with the minority question uh, through the theory of a uh, right to self determination within the marxian framework the way soviet union tried to deal with this question but of course as you know that the communist solution to this minority problem 
you know, ex got completely blasted in 1991 after disintegration of Soviet Union. So therefore, in fact, this socialist and the communist solution of this uh, minority problem uh, was basically short-lived. Of course, China has managed its minority issue uh, through a particular mode of engagement uh, with socialism, with market economy, with growth and other things. But you know, that is beside the point here. So therefore, what happens? That minority consciousness normally it is seen uh, that crystallizes with feeling of deprivation and exploitation. Particularly, uh, you know, when there is a permanent sense of majority and minority identity in society. And therefore, what happened that minority discri discrimination, uh, you know, is always considered to be, you know, very uh, detrimental from the point of view of, uh, you know, democratic society and democratic, uh, you know, democratic governance. Now, I'm, you know, I'm reminded of B. R. Ambedkar, uh, the chairman of the drafting committee of Indian constitution. In fact, he made a very uh, perceptive statement in the constituent assembly itself uh, when he said that the minority rights are absolute, not relative, uh, particularly while responding to a debate. Uh, and then also mentioned that minority is explosive force and therefore one has to simply uh, create a constitutional framework under which the minorities will stop thinking in terms of their minority identity. And the fate of minority will depend on the behavior of majority. If majority behaves properly, then minority will have no uh, you know, basis to feel discriminated or to be treated as minority. So that was a very you know, perceptive and very prophetic statement on the floor of the constituent assembly by none other than Ambedkar. Um, so therefore, uh, in fact, this is something important. Of course, sometimes minority, minority sometimes also uh, becomes, you know, uh, you know, a, a class or one can say a section in society uh, which is not discriminated but rather discriminate against others. And here one can give the example of South Africa, particularly the apartheid regime, that how white minority discriminated against the majority of the blacks. So therefore, uh, and uh, the later attempts by Nelson Mandela, and particularly after the end of apartheid regime, the way South Africa dealt with this issue is also commendable. Particularly, uh, instead of uh, you know retaliation, they thought in terms of uh, reconciliation, particularly Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, which was formed in South Africa, is the best example of this. Now, of course, there have been many solutions for this minority problem. As I was mentioning earlier, that you know the liberal and the Marxist have tried to deal with this problem through their own ideological and political framework. Uh, and uh, the Soviet experiment, as I mentioned, that ended in fiasco. But you know this other important thing to remember that normally there are three ways through which this minority problem uh, is dealt with. One through autonomy by granting autonomy to the areas which are basically inhabited by the minorities. Number two, by granting self-government, which is perhaps always the demand of the minority groups. And the third is secession, uh, that you know, minorities try to secede from uh, you know, the main line, mainland. And therefore, uh, that is basically something related to the self-government, but secession, you know, that, that takes a different form, secession. But you know, all these three things have been tried uh, from time to time in different uh, societies. And uh, sometimes they work, particularly autonomy and self-government. Secession, of course, leads to, uh, you know, the violence. So therefore, these are not considered to be the ideal solution for democracy. Now, this constitutional theory uh, has basically come forward with an argument, uh, which is something very refreshing. Because within the given constitutional political framework, by uh, bringing in, you know, the idea of grand coalition, segmented autonomy, minority, minority veto and other things. Uh, it tries to basically tide over this problem and provide a stable democratic government in a segmented, plural and complex society. Now, of course, you know, there are two ways through which, you know, the country after country has dealt with this issue. One is the through unitary structure, that is assimilation or genocide. For example, we know about genocide that how, uh, you know, during the phase of imperialism and colonization, 
uh, many aboriginal uh, you know inhabitants of uh, america and other places uh, you know completely got liquidated uh, another is through assimilation but you know assimilation also has been attempted in many countries but they also leads to backlash so therefore uh, in fact these you know either uh, genocide or assimilation are today not considered a uh, very powerful uh, means for you know for, for for providing a stable democracy in a complex society or for purpose of nation building a multicultural nation building and it is in this context that we can see today the popularity of multicultural theory uh, you know in various uh, democracies that how multiculturalism today has become a powerful discourse a powerful tool to you know to 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 establish a more effective and uh, functioning democracy in a complex society the united states of america uh, who, who, you know where at one point of time we heard about melting pot arguments so far as a nation and uh, building project is concerned has basically switched over from melting pot argument to the multicultural argument so is the case with canada so is perhaps many countries in europe so multiculturalism has emerged as a response to the kind of problems which emerged after assimilation uh, which led to backlash or genocide which led to violence so therefore in recent in modern times we have seen the major trend is in direction of reconciliation and integration uh, not obliterating but accommodating plurality of cultures and plurality of interests and there are number of mechanisms through which this you know reconciliation and integration are done uh, sometimes it is done through affirmative action sometimes it is done through reservation for example the way it is they have been done in united states of america india malaysia uh, many other countries sometimes you know other mechanisms are also adopted for example uh, you know outside mediation this is south africa they were mentioning about truth and reconciliation uh, you know uh, commission but the most practical solution uh, which is considered today uh, you know from the point of building of democracy in a plural complex and segmented society is power sharing and it is here we can see the value of this constitutional theory now this power sharing what is this power sharing as i was mentioning that leford talks about four premises of uh, you know of constitutionalism or constitutional theory first is the grand coalition second is the segmented autonomy third is basically uh, you know the proportionality and the fourth is the minority veto we'll have a look at all these four uh, slightly in more detail because these are the important premises of constitutional democracy and constitutionalism uh, so therefore uh, what is this grand coalition in fact this grand coalition stands for government through power sharing elites from the different segments of society are inducted in government and therefore what happens that the voice in the decision making process is given to multiple groups and multiple identities in fact attempt is made to establish a rough parity in a sphere of public resources uh, particularly so far as allocation and distribution uh, is concerned and there are some examples also existing examples for example one such example is switzerland another is belgium of course both european countries small countries of course one can say that their uh, you know segmentation is not as sharp as many other countries in other continents but nonetheless these are the very good examples where such you know mechanism has been adopted and it has worked well so therefore in fact this is something about the grand coalition the next is segmented autonomy what does it mean now segmented autonomy means that in cultural affairs uh, in a sphere minorities are ensured autonomy cultural affairs include personal law cultural affairs includes education uh, particularly in you know, the primary education where the mother tongues becomes very important cultural affair you know means that many laws governing inheritance and contract so therefore in this sphere uh, you know a kind of autonomy is given to minorities so that they don't you know uh, a nurture a feeling uh, that you know their identity is getting swamped under the majoritarian onslaught 
So therefore, the segmented autonomy is another important dimension which has been highlighted by this consciousness theory. The third is proportionality. Now, this proportionality stands for basically proportional representation, uh, both in elections, in voting system, as well as in employment. Uh, in fact, uh, this is something which is secured normally uh, in elections, in voting, through proportional representation system, that is called PR system, against this majoritarian system, which is basically, uh, you know, called first past the post system. So, this PR system is considered a mechanism through which the proportionality of various groups is ensured uh, in legislature, uh, through elections and through voting. On the other hand, in employment, this proportionality is attained uh, through affirmative action and reservation about which I was just now mentioning. And United States of America, India, Malaysia, many countries in today's world are basically taking recourse to this proportional representation. The purpose is to ensure that no particular group gets undue, uh, you know, weightage or representation in public services, so that it leads to a kind of, you know, feeling of discrimination, and also uh, basically leads to resentment, and also, uh, you know, that creates turmoil and becomes uh, detrimental for stability and for democracy. So therefore, this proportionality is the third argument of Lefort so far as this constitutional uh, theory is concerned. The fourth argument, the fourth, prima, fourth premise of Lefort is, uh, you know, minority vote. And here, minority veto. And this is also important. What is this minority veto? Minority veto is that minority gets the right to veto on policies which are detrimental to their rights. So therefore, in fact, in a situation where minorities at any stage feel that some law is being enacted or certain action is in the offing, uh, which may result into, uh, you know, curtailment of their rights or any constitutional guarantee or any, uh, you know, uh, any commitment which is basically part of the larger democratic consensus, then the minorities are armed with a veto so that they can veto and stop that process. So therefore, this is a very powerful tool in the hands of minorities, which they feel that are perhaps the, the safeguard given to them in a system where, uh, you know, of course, democracy works on the principle of majority, so far as the number is concerned. But nonetheless, they feel that these are the protective measures available to them through which they can protect their rights their interests. So therefore, these four premises have been, uh, you know, have been laid down by the constitutional theorist and most notably its high priest, that is Lefort, and particularly on basis of the number of empirical studies uh, which, is, which are cited uh, in support of this argument, be it Switzerland, be it, uh, you know, uh, you know, Sweden or the Netherlands or other countries from the Europe. Of course, uh, you know, the Lefort also includes India as a case of constitutional story. I will come to this issue, particularly when he engaged in a debate with Paul Braffs, an uh, American political scientist who specializes on India. And he said that India is an example where, you know, a, in a plural society, democracy has survived and has been stable without having this constitutional, uh, you know, mode of democratic, uh, you know, engagement. But Lefort, you know, on basis of uh, his own study of India, of course, primarily relying on a very pioneer work, you know, done by Rajini Kothari through his Congress system, has tried to demonstrate that India is not a deviant case, but rather is a conforming case of constitutionalism. I will turn to this issue a little later, particularly when I will come to this issue. So what I am trying to mention here, that apart from Europe, uh, Belgium, Sweden, Netherlands, the Netherlands, uh, you know, and uh, in many other countries, uh, of course, the small countries of Europe with little uh, different type of segmentation. Uh, you know, Lefort also mentions India as a case, also mentions Malaysia as a case, also mentions Singapore as a case, that how, you know, a, a kind of uh, constitutional measures have helped them 
to provide or to establish a stable democracy. In India, Indian case, of course, uh, he does a periodization that 1947 to 60, particularly that Nehruvian period, he believes that India practiced a constitutional democracy. But after 60s, after 67, his argument is that India drifted from constitutionalism, particularly, uh, you know, Mrs. Indira Gandhi's regime. But of course, there is a lot of debate on this. Many people feel that no, even in recent years, the Indian society has become more constitutional than what it was in 60s. So anyway, this is something, uh, you know, to be remembered. So what I'm basically trying to mention that these four premises, which have been laid down by the constitutional theories, uh, are the important tools through which, uh, you know, democracy is made stable in a segmented and a plural society. And the age-old dilemma of democracy, that whether democracy can exist, can survive in a plural heterogeneous society, has been basically addressed. Now, coming to this uh, question, that segmented society, as it comes very often, because the major premise is uh, to, you know, to, to establish a linkage between, uh, you know, constitutional democracy and segmented society. What is this segmented society? Now, segmented society, according to this theory, would be a society where behavior of people is bound by close social ties based upon language and religion. Uh, in fact, in such society, in such segmented society, political system operates on the principle of simple majority rule. Uh, you know, in such society, political system operating on the principle of simple majority rule will not work at all. Because here, the majoritarian principles will lead to backlash. And therefore, it is argued that in such society, there is a need to think in different uh, you know, in, in different terms. And those terms are basically provided through this constitutional society, a constitutional theory. Now, uh, you know, in this segmented society, it's further argued that every group will be apprehensive about others. Normally, what happens that, you know, the kind of sharp uh, division in society, sharp segmentation, uh, you know, the intergroup relationship is always very uh, delicate. And therefore, every group is apprehensive about every other group. So therefore, these are the characteristics of segmented society as per the constitutional theory is concerned. In fact, in this, uh, you know, constitutional theory, particularly so far as the segmented society is concerned, the argument is also uh, given that the need of institutions are felt or need of institutions are always there that allow various groups to share and enjoy power through grand coalition. So therefore, there is a need for institutional mechanisms, not ad hoc, temporary, whimsical, but rather more institutional, more stable and long term mechanisms, particularly uh, in through which the, you know, the idea of grand coalition and power sharing can work. So in a nutshell, one can say that it is opposite of majoritarian system. Because as I mentioned in the very beginning, that it is also argued that majoritarian system will not work in this, uh, you know, segmented society at all. Now, of course, majoritarian democracy and constitutional democracy. Uh, you know, what are the differences? Uh, because, you know, constitutional democracy has been thought of as an alternative to majoritarian democracy, because majoritarian democracy is fine for a homogeneous society where the segmentation is absent or less sharp. But when the segmentation becomes sharp, when the society is plural, when the society is heterogeneous, then majoritarian principles are unworkable. So what are the differences between majoritarian democracy and constitutional democracy? Now, so far this difference between the two is concerned. Majoritarian democracy integrates minority groups through distribution of individual rights. And here we are reminded of the liberal, Western liberal democracy, which started as majoritarian democracy. Most of them started as majoritarian democracy. As I was mentioning, that gradually they are making a shift from majoritarian to consensual or something closer to consensual. When uh, from individual rights, they are also transiting to group rights and the community rights, which are basically multicultural in character, particularly offshoot of multicultural theory. But nonetheless, uh, this is something uh, which also becomes, uh, you know, important from the point of view of constitutional theory.
Now, so therefore, this majoritarian democracy on the one hand integrates minority groups through distribution of individual rights and it feels that it is the best guarantee. If their individual rights are guaranteed in the constitution, then the minority's feelings will be assuaged. They will have no reason to grudge anything. But it has been observed that just by giving individual rights, uh, you know, is not enough so far as the minority, uh, you know, existence is concerned. And therefore, this gradual clamor for group and community rights to the extent that even United Nations Universal Declaration of Rights of 1948 didn't imagine collective and group rights, but later on only through amendments that they have incorporated these provisions, particularly after multiculturalism and other theories made appearance on intellectual horizon. So therefore, this is a limitation of majoritarian democracy. But initially, in the formative phase in modern times, when liberal democracy took roots in Western world, it was only through this mechanism. That is the mechanism of integrating minorities through individual rights. And it is here uh, I was referring earlier about the melting pot argument of American nationalism. But on the other hand, the constitutional democracy deviating from this majoritarian uh, way of integrating minorities through distribution of individual rights seeks to accommodate minorities through collective rights. So therefore, whereas majoritarian democracy integrates, constitutional democracy accommodates. So therefore, there is a difference between integration and accommodation and the difference between individual rights and the collective rights. Uh, now, in fact, there are many scholars who point out that to some extent it is similar to what corporatism as it exists in many uh, continental European countries, uh, you know, is similar to that because they also talk of such community rights. But one thing is important to remember that corporatism as a theory is more applicable to economic sphere than the cultural, political and social about which perhaps consciousnessism talks about. Another important uh, you know, difference between majoritarian and uh, you know, the consciousnessional theory uh, is that you know, because the majoritarian democracy essentially was a product of a period uh, or one can say that you know, it later on uh, got also some you know, boost from the pluralist theory which was built around this majoritarian uh, you know, democratic uh, you know, system and tried to basically enrich it uh, by talking about uh, a different type of mechanism to deepen and uh, also uh, deepen democracy. And it is here that a classical pluralism becomes important uh, about which we discussed earlier. Now the pluralist theory uh, earlier only dealt with heterogeneity of groups. For example, Dahl, Robert Dahl talked about his famous polyarchy. Particularly this entire context of pluralist theory at that time was against the elitist theory of democracy which only talked about you know, iron law of oligarchy like Mitchell's Mosca, Pareto and other elitist theory who only believe that only elites can rule and the liberal democracies are the democracy in which elite circulation and elites rule are there. But on the other hand these pluralists try to establish that no in liberal democracy it is not the elites who rule but the various groups come together and various groups have equal say in the decision making. So therefore it was not individual elites or the elites of the society, but rather the groups who basically collaborated and came together to govern these societies. But you know, the pluralists were concerned with the tyranny of the majority I was, I was mentioning, and therefore it was trying to establish that the, how the tyranny of majority could be checkmated. But the constitutional arguments gave, gives a more theoretical breakthrough, and therefore one can say that it is more refreshing that the way constitutional theory builds its argument uh, going far ahead of what the classical pluralist argued at that time. Now, of course, uh, before uh, we, we uh, move to other section of our discussion, one thing we should remember that the constitutional theories, when the talk of constitutional democracy, uh, you know, talk of both empirical and normative value of their theory. Uh, the empirical value, they say that constitutional theory empirically explains factors behind political stability in number of small but plural European democracies 
and some of the examples I had cited earlier also Austria, Belgium, the Netherlands, the Switzerland, the classic uh, case of such concessional uh, democracy in Europe. But at the same time, it, this theory also says that normatively, uh, concessionalism shows larger importance in context of the evolution of democracy in many other plural societies in the world, outside Europe, particularly Asia, Africa and Latin America. And therefore, as a value system, it tries to establish that how some of the premises of concessionalism can be tried and attempted even in other plural societies and its result can be seen in terms of stability. Now, Lefford, of course, argues that outside Western democracy, there is a vast arena where variety of soft cleavages have led to political instability. And that instability can be seen the way, you know, the governments have oscillated between democracy and dictatorship. And Africa, perhaps, is the worst example. In, in fact, Asia, some of the Asian countries are also the example of oscillation between democracy and dictatorship. But at the same time, Leopold also argues that the success of smaller European countries in running a stable democracy in spite of soft cleavages uh, can be a role model to emulate. Uh, particularly those countries which are basically beset with this problem. Now, of course, uh, you know, uh, there, you know, the, the theorist of constitutionalism uh, cites examples, uh, you know, multiple examples from uh, various, uh, you know, continents just to buttress the argument that how constitutional democracy has successfully worked. And here they give the example of Switzerland, particularly after 1943. Austria from 1945 to 66, this is a period they feel that it was purely a constitutional, uh, you know, system. Belgium after the First World War, the Netherlands between 1917 to 67, and Czechoslovakia after 89 till 93, uh, particularly that uh, period when basically the entire Eastern Europe was witnessing turmoil. Now coming to India, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Leopold argues, uh, you know, that 1947 to 60s, mid-60s, particularly 67, uh, is the period when India witnessed constitutional democracy. And it is here, he basically relies on the Congress system of, uh, you know, Rajini Kothari as a, uh, you know, a very innovative way of power sharing among various groups, particularly through consensus building. And the way he basically analyzed, Kothari analyzed Indian party system. Uh, as a party of consensus and party of pressure. And particularly a number of provisions, uh, you know, from Indian constitution and later, uh, you know, uh, incorporation in India's uh, political uh, discourse. In fact, Lefort cites, for example, linguistic reorganization of states. Then, of course, the minority rights which were granted to the uh, minorities in the constitution, including the famous fundamental right in our article 29 and 30, particularly personal laws and other things. Then he also cites, you know, number of other instances, uh, particularly uh, the way he mentions the Shahwano, of course, that comes from 80s, that the way, uh, you know, judiciary judgment, you know, Supreme Court judgment went against the personal laws, but the way parliament acted. So therefore, this power sharing argument uh, he feels that was from 47 to 60. And later on, he believes that there was deviation uh, because of Mrs. Indira Gandhi's regime and the centralization associated with that regime. But at the same time, he also argues that India has successfully practiced uh, democracy through a majoritarian system of representation, that is, first past the post system, was largely on account of certain you know, this constitutional features which can be seen uh, operating in India. And some of these features, as I mentioned, that he cites. In a very interesting piece which he wrote in 1996 in American Political Science Review, uh, and, uh, you know, reverting uh, some of uh, the charges of Paul Brass, uh, who had argued that India is offering a case of deviation from this theory, because India is a case of a stable and functioning democracy in a segmented society, but is not a constitutional democracy, because neither proportional system of representation is here, like continental Europe, 
nor you have a coalition building of the power sharing. So, you know, Paul Brussels' argument was refuted by Lefford in this uh, piece of writing, which I just now mentioned. Now, then after India, you know, Lefford also argues that Colombia is another case from 58 to 74, Malaysia from 1955, South Africa after 1994, after the end of apartheid regime. But at the same time, he also mentions that the Cyprus and Lebanon tried uh, this experiment, but this experiment ended in civil war. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, perhaps some of the constitutional theorists argue that European Union can also be considered as an experiment, uh, you know, in this uh, domain. Now, of course, there are many scholars who point out that what is the difference between federal and constitutional theories? Because as I mentioned, that federalism was also innovated essentially uh, from this point of view of making democracy workable, stable, and functioning, uh, functional uh, in context of number of challenges. So federalism, of course, is a very important tool today in a complex multicultural plural societies to deal with the group interests and the group identities. And therefore, country after country is switching over to the federal mode of governance. But there are differences. And the differences are essentially that federal theory still is territorial in nature. So therefore, in those countries where the group identities are territorially located, there is a conjunction between territory and the group identity. Federalism is an ideal way to deal with this problem and to make democracy you know, functional as well as stable. But constitutional theory is mostly non-territorial. So therefore, uh, in fact, that is an important difference to be kept in mind. Now, constitutional democracy stands for coalition of all groups, provision of minority veto, proportional representation in cabinet and civil services, rough parity in financial allocation, and cultural autonomy in personal law and education. So these are some of the ways in which the constitutional theory tries to operationalize the system of government. Whereas the federalism through division of power, through written constitution, through independence of judiciary, but nonetheless, it essentially is based on the territorial uh, premise. So that is perhaps the constitutionalism is non-territorial in its premise, that groups which are non-territorial. For example, in India, many people say that there are many groups which don't have territorial identity. Because many country groups are available or basically are in, uh, you know, they exist in different territories of India. There is no special linkage between territory and group identity, except perhaps the Sikhs in Punjab and the tribals in northeastern states. So therefore, many countries in the world having this sort of problem, largely after this immigration problem in the globalized world. And here, consensualism is more effective than federalism as a tool. Of course, there are criticisms also. Criticisms of constitutional theory is that it neglects oppositional space in democracy when it talks of coalition. Therefore, you know, it does imagine oppositional space also is important in democracy. So that is one. Secondly, it leads to limited government because when the challenges are manifold, then perhaps this type of coalition government becomes a limited government and will not be able to face the challenges. Third is the grand coalition is impossible in severe divisions in societies. And fourth is that this theory seems to be attractive only to minorities. Majority may not be drawn to this theory. And uh, next is that, you know, few full-blown constitutional regimes are available, only some features from this constitutional theory, which as Lefford had talked about, can be seen in the constitutional regimes, which are basically referred. Horowitz, a very important comparativist, has argued that the grand coalition and minority veto are a scarce today in today's world. Similarly, Brian Barry, political theorist, points out a contradiction in this theory, saying that when it is required, when the situation is ripe, it is not required. When it is done, the situation does not support it. So this is how, uh, you know, some of the criticism. But also, one should remember that this theory is the refinement of the pluralist principles of society uh, with big cleavages. Uh, in fact, not only, of course, the theorists were very realistic uh, in accepting the fact that it is not applicable in all, all situations. 
For example, Lefort himself ruled out its application in case of Northern Ireland, where subcultural hostility was very sharp. Now, uh, Lefort therefore goes to the extent of saying that Ireland can be considered an aberration. But nonetheless, uh, you know, the countries like India, Malaysia, which were also referred and cited by many scholars as an aberration and deviant case, Lefort believes that they conform to this consciousness theory because many mechanisms they have adopted in order to, you know, make it more stable and functioning. So this is how this entire theory uh, becomes a very powerful intervention so far as the debate on democracy is concerned, particularly in context of plural, segmented, and heterogeneous society. Thank you.